<laughs> okay, so it's good to see you. How about you, Ghani? How about his uh, Kwanzaa? Happy Kwanzaa. And happy Kwanzaa to African people all over the world. African people everywhere throughout the world, African community. We bring you Kwanzaa greetings of celebration, solidarity, and continuing struggle for good in the world. Head is our Kwanzaa. Head is our Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa is a special time, a special season and celebration of our sacred and expansive self as African people. It is a unique Pan-African time of remembrance, reflection, reaffirmation, and recommitment. It is a special and unique time to remember and honor our ancestors, to reflect on what it means to be an African and to be human in the most expansive and meaningful sense. And it is a time to reaffirm the sacred beauty and goodness of ourselves and the rightfulness of our relentless struggle to be ourselves and to free ourselves and to contribute to an ever expanding realm of freedom, justice, and caring in the world. And Kwanzaa is a special and unique time and Pan-African space to recommit ourselves to our highest values and teach us to live our lives, to do our work, and to wage our struggle in dignity affirming, life enhancing, and world preserving ways as we continue forward on the upward path of our honored ancestors. These values teach us to speak truth and to do justice, to honor our elders and our ancestors, to cherish and challenge our children, to care for the poor and the vulnerable among us, to have a rightful relationship with the environment, to constantly struggle against evil, injustice, and oppression, and to always raise up praise and pursue the good. For we are morally compelled, the ancient texts tell us, to bear witness to truth and to set the scales of justice in their proper place, especially among those who have no voice, the devalued and the marginalized and the disempowered. But we are celebrating in a different kind of time now. Our celebration this year is of necessity different even though it is no less necessary and needed. For we gather together this year to celebrate Kwanzaa in the midst of a devastating pandemic called COVID-19, which continues to create great loss of life, widespread disabling illness, economic havoc, immense suffering, and a health crisis of mon monumental proportion the infections and deadly nature of the disease has compelled us to practice physical distancing, to limit face-to-face -face contact everywhere. And this has taken a heavy toll on us as persons, as a people, even though we know it is necessary for our health and safety. And so we are now compelled to reconceive our choreographies of closeness to rethink the familiar rhythms of our daily lives and to realign our lives to deal with the new realities we face. And we must do this, our people, without conceding or compromising our relational closeness. I repeat, we must do this without compromising or conceding our relational closeness and without losing the soul defining essence of who we are as persons and a people. Moreover, we continue to suffer not only from the pandemic of coronavirus, but also from the persistent and pervasive pathology of oppression in all its vicious and various form. And yet still our history and culture and the demand of our times call on us and compel us to be resolute and relentless in our resistance to oppression and resilient and resourceful in our struggle to recover from this disease and to care for each other in rightfully African way. Here, <clears throat> our poet laureate, Gwen Brooks, reminds us that we will weather this winter as we have others before. For we are people, she said, who are constantly, must constantly, quote, conduct our blooming in the noise and whip of the whirlwind. 
we who have survived the Holocaust of enslavement, colonialism, imperialism, and numerous hurricanes of history, we will, as Harry Thurman taught, this spiritual teacher taught us and challenged us to do, we must ride, quote, ride the storm and remain intact. And we will do that. We will ride this storm and remain intact for we are a resourceful and resilient people. In fact, Nanny Bearers, our foremother said, we must remember that we are the people who specialize in the holy impossible. We are the people who specialize in the holy impossible. The, con the conception and practice of Kwanzaa is rooted in both ancient African harvest celebrations and the Black Freedom Movement. Moreover, Kwanzaa calls for and urges us to have an active and ongoing commitment to African and human good and the well being of the world. When we talk about the African origin of Kwanzaa, we talk about the five fundamental activities that we are borrowed from and build on from those. And they must go on even in the midst of COVID-19. And these are the end gathering of the people to reaffirm the bonds between them. Even though we have to end gather virtually, we still have to gather. Kwanzaa is home-based. It's also communal and public, but it's home-based. And here's a chance for us to rebuild our homes, to strengthen our homes, and to reach out to our other relatives throughout the country and the world, right? And so the end gathering of the people must be there. Second, it's a time for special reverence, uh, special respect and reverence for creator and creation. Time to reaffirm our gratitude and thankfulness for the abundant harvest and therefore make a commitment to protect and preserve the earth which provided that harvest. And that means that it is not only the corporations that must be restrained, but also our consumerism must be constrained. And we must in fact actively preserve and protect this awesome shared legacy we call earth. It is important then also to know that Kwanzaa comes from the Black Freedom Movement. And from that Black Freedom Movement comes this struggle to be ourselves and to free ourselves. And Kwanzaa and Guzo Saba are part and parcel of that struggle. And in that struggle to be ourselves and free ourselves, we develop a language, a language of social and racial justice, a language of liberation, a language of self-determination, <coughs> a language of freedom now, a language of no justice, no peace. We develop this language and it's inside Kwanzaa when it is practiced correctly. And so we move now to the third, third one, and that is commitment for me, commemoration of the past. Time to raise up and praise the name of our ancestors who gave their lives so that we could live full and more meaningful one those ancestors who opened the way, the way openers and the way makers who taught us good and beautiful, dignity affirming, life enhancing and world preserving ways to walk and live in the world. Kwanzaa is also a time and we must continue that to raise up and recommit ourselves to our highest values. As I've said before, those values that are again, dignity affirming, life enhancing and world preserving. And at the heart of these are the Nguzo Saba, the seven principles. And finally, Kwanzaa is a time for celebration of the good, the good of life, even in the midst of the uh, worst things happening. We must be thankful for life and the strength to fight, to drive away the darkness so that light could be lifted up. This is the lightning of the candles that has so much important to us that it becomes a way to talk about and symbolize lighting these eternal principles. We are taught in the Husea that we're given that which endures in the midst of that which is overthrown. 
and that which endures in the midst of that which is overthrown or our moral and spiritual values. And so we light these candles and in lighting these candles, we symbolize lifting up the light that lasts. The Husea says, I've come to drive away darkness so that light could be lifted up, so that knowledge could be lifted up, so that the warmth of knowledge and the opening of the path to a new future can be lifted up. I've come to do that. And so when we light the candle and we recommit ourselves to the best of what it means to be African and human, we do just that. And so again, our, our, our for holiday calls for and urges an active and ongoing commitment to African and human good and the well-being of the world. So here we are struggling not only for the well-being of the world, right? But for African and human good. Not only for African and human good, but also the well-being of the world. This year's annual theme is Kwanzaa and the well-being of the world, living and uplifting the seven principles. It seeks to call rightful attentiveness to the immediate and urgent need to be actively concerned and caring about the well-being of the world and all in it. For as Grammy and Krumah taught us, the affairs of Africa cannot be isolated from the world as a whole. And the United World African community must, quote, become one of the greatest forces for good in the world. What a beautiful concept that African people must become one of the greatest forces for good in the world. And we are, but together and struggling more, we'll be even a greater force for good in the world. And the crisis and challenge for us then, are not only the daily and destructive assaults on the earth and its ecosystem, its soil, its fields, its forests, its waters and waterways, its air and atmosphere, its animals and their habitat, and the resulting disease and devastation represented in COVID, right? But we must also be concerned with the domination, deprivation, and degradation of humans themselves by systems of interrelated oppression. This results in unfreedom, unhealthiness, and illness, homelessness, greater vulnerability to diseases, loss and lack of income, police violence, food insecurity, and lack of access to pure water, lack of access to income and quality education and other necessities of life. And this must be righteously and relentlessly resisted and overcome. For in such a context of devastation and oppression, there is no real or reliable remedy except resistance and serious sustained struggle that is dedicated again to African and human good and the well-being of the world and all in it. And Kwanzaa and Kawaida philosophy out of which Kwanzaa and the Nguzo Saba were created, posed the Nguzo Saba, the seven principles, as a foundational way forward. I said the Nguzo Saba or a foundational way forward in order for us to achieve maximum African and human good and the well-being of the world and all in it. And it is a challenge to each and all of us Indeed, the Nguzo Saba offers us an African value system that provides morally grounded guidance for our lives and living. They serve as a mirror and measure of our living up to our highest and most beneficial values. What are these principles? They are Omoja, unity, Kujichagilia, self-determination, Ujima, collective working responsibility, Ujamaa, cooperative economics, Nia, purpose, Kaumba, creativity, and Imani faith. The first principle, Umoja, begins with ourselves. How can we talk about the world if we jump over ourselves? How can we talk about humanity if we don't respect the unique and equally valid and valuable way of being human that we as Africans are? So we talk unity, we must talk about ourselves first, right? And we must unify ourselves. But at the same time, we must also expand outward to include others in the world. This principle, as Anna Julia Cooper sums it up, is this, quote, we take our stand on the solidarity of humanity, the oneness of life, and the unnaturalness of all special favoritisms, whether of race, sex, country, or condition. 
The mojo urges a moral sensitivity and caring kinship with each other, with other human beings and all living beings and with the world itself. For as our ancestors taught, we're not only human beings, Watu in Swahili, human being, but we also world being, Walimwengu in, in Swahili. And so isn't that a beautiful concept that we're not just human beings, we're world beings. We're not just concerned with our own species, but we're concerned with the health, wholeness, and well-being of the world and all in it. That's what being a world being is. And therefore, the Odu Ifa says we have to stop pursuing and making sacrifices for wealth and start making sacrifice to protect the earth from its enemies. And what are those enemies? They are plunder, pollution, and depletion, right? And we must struggle against those enemies of earth. And we must do it in a united fashion. Therefore, Odu Ifa says, when it becomes our turn to take responsibility for the world, we should do good for the world. The second principle is Kuchakali, self-determination. It teaches us we must think and act for ourselves and define ourselves by the good we choose and the good we do. We must choose good and we must do good. It speaks to our right and responsibility to be ourselves and to free ourselves and to make our own unique contribution to the radical reimagining and remaking of our societies in the world. And Kujichagalia stresses our moral obligation to reaffirm and support this right of others, especially those oppressed and who are struggling for freedom, those who are wrong and injured and are struggling for justice, and those who are disempowered and struggling for power over their destiny and daily life. For still the oppressed want freedom, the wrong and injured want justice, the people want power over their destiny and daily lives, and the world wants peace. But the peace must be a peace with justice. That is what Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King meant when he said, peace is not simply the absence of tension, it's also the presence of justice. And so we say, no justice, no peace. But if we do peace with justice, then the Husea teaches us that, quote, exceedingly good is the presence of peace. And there is no blame in peace for those who practice it. The third principle, Uchima, collective work and responsibility. This principle speaks to the ethical obligation and transformative practice of building together the good world we all want and deserve to live in and to leave as a legacy for future generation. This principle teaches us to recognize and respect the common good in and of the world, to cultivate and harvest <clears throat> and respect to cultivate and harvest it together and to practice an ethics of sharing this and other good in the world. We must share the world. We must share status. We must share knowledge. We must share space. We must share power. We must share wealth. We must share interest. And we must share the responsibility for building the good world we all want and deserve to live in. The fourth principle is Ujamaa, cooperative economic. It lifts up and promotes the values of shared work and shared wealth, the right of all people to a decent and dignity affirming life, and thus the right of all people to a just and equitable share of the common goods of the world. Indeed, as Wangari Matai taught, we must now rethink our relationship with the living world and rethink the way we manage resources. And we must resolutely and continuously resist mindless consumerism and the plunder, pollution, and depletion of the world by corporations and countries who ride roughshod over the earth and the vulnerable peoples in it. The fifth principle, near purpose, teaches us the collective vocation of constant building and developing the capacity of our people to be ourselves and free ourselves to pursue an expansive good and come into the fullness of ourselves, to realize the good and the potential within us and to make our own unique contribution to the forward flow of human history. And this principle of Nia reaffirms the interrelatedness of the pursuit of African and human good and the well-being of the world. For it remembers 
and reaffirm, reaffirms the sacred teaching of our ancestors in the Hussia that said the good we do for others and the world, we are also doing for ourselves. For we are doing what? Building a moral community and good world we all want and deserve to live in. And always it says to us, when we say that we want to restore our people to their traditional greatness, that we remember what the Egyptians taught, our ancestors in the Nile said, the Kemites said, the wise are known by their wisdom, but the great are known by their good deeds. So let us do good in the world. Martin Luther King said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Service is the way that we become good. And the way we actually become great. All the religious leaders that you think are great, all the social leaders that you think are great, are great because of their service. And I'm ever reminded of Mary McLeod Bethune's statement, I paraphrase here, that we should so live our lives that even when we lie down in death, we stand tall on the platform of service. And the final, the sixth principle is Kuumba creativity. It uplifts and promotes the practice of the ancient African ethical principle of Sarujta, the moral obligation to repair, renew, and remake the world, making it more beneficial and beautiful than we inherited. It interprets this as both a social and environmental practice. We're not simply to repair the world as a natural phenomenon, but we're supposed to repair the world as a social phenomenon. Again, when I talk about Kwanzaa and the well-being of the world, it's an inclusive concept, the well-being of the natural world and the world well-being of the social world, the human world in societies, in actual societies, living and dying and working and building in actual societies. And we have a moral obligation to repair this world. And that is when we say Saruj Ta, it means to <clears throat> raise up what is in ruins, to repair what is damaged, to rejoin what is divided, to replenish what is depleted, to set right what is wrong, to strengthen what is weakened, and to make flourish that which is fragile and undeveloped. And so we must, in fact, heal and repair the world for oppression. And again, not just the environmental world, but also the social world, for oppression is damaging and destructive, not only to the natural world, but to us as human beings, right? And as a moral and social vanguard, we African people must see ourselves in our ultimate agency as injured physicians who will heal, repair, and renew and remake ourselves in the process and practice of repairing, renewing, and remaking the world. For as Mary McClabbertoon taught, our task is to remake the world. It is nothing less than that. If we leave the world unrepaired, unrenewed, and unremade, then we will always suffer oppression and the earth will always be under threat of being constantly violated, plundered, polluted, and depleted. The seventh and final principle is Imani. As I've always said, I start with Umoja because without unity, nothing is possible. You can't build family, you can't be, build community, you can't build nation, you can't build race, you can't be a friendship, you can't be an organization, you can't build a movement without unity, right? So we need to start with that first. But without faith, I put it at the end, because without faith, you can't sustain yourself. You could go all the way to those other uh, six principles, but eventually you'll do what many people have done from the 60s. They talked bad, they made a lot of noise, right? They got a lot of press, but they walked away from the battlefield before the struggle was won. We can't do that. We must realize that what Malcolm said, that we owe it to ourselves to struggle to create good in the world and that we must recognize that wherever black people are, there's a battle line 
that whether we're in the east or the west or north or the south, you and I are living in a country that is a battle line for everyone, for all of us, for all of us, right? All black people, right? We have to recognize that. We might not want to be at war, but we're in one and we have to recognize that and struggle. And we cannot walk away from the battle line. And as Paul Robeson said before Malcolm, he said, the battlefront is everywhere. There's no sheltered rear. You can't hide. You can't just be satisfied with seeking a comfortable place in oppression. You must create good in the world. That's what our culture demands. That's what our history demands. That's what our current situation remain, remain, demands. So the seven principles in mining, and it teaches us to believe in the good and our capacity to achieve it. It teaches us to believe we have a capacity to share it. And we don't have to hoard the good, the common good, that we have to share it. That's the beauty of the harvest model. We plan it together. We plant the seeds we cultivate together. We harvest together and we share the good together. And we must share that good, harness it, and leave it as a legacy worthy for those who come after us. Let us have faith then in, a, in the sacred teachings of our ancestors which say to us across the millennia in the Odu Ifa, let's do things with joy for surely humans have been divinely chosen to bring good into the world. And this is the fundamental mission and meaning of human life. We don't have to be over anybody. We don't have to claim we're the chosen people or the elect or all that other, right? We don't need that. There is no chosen. No one is more chosen than us. No one is more elect than us. No one is more worthy or sacred or holy than us. No one's history has more meaning to us than ours, right? We have to take that position. We have to have faith in ourselves, right? People say, you know, why didn't you say faith in God? Well, you're going to say that. The question is not with God. You know, people, people don't really just come out, I'm against God, right? But they do come out and be against each other. That's the problem, right? And so we want to start with the people and assume as we did in ancient Africa, that everybody believes in the transcendent and everybody wants to have one of the high, the high standards of humankind, right? All right, that's, that's a given, right? Now, how do you work in your daily life? Do you speak truth and do justice, right? Do you care for the poor and the vulnerable, right? Do you have a right, rightful relationship with them? Bob, that's what we've got to add. So when we say faith, right? We want you to believe, we say, in ourselves, in our creator, in our mothers, our fathers, our sisters, our brothers, grandmothers, and grandfathers, our elders, our youth, our future. Faith in all that makes us beautiful and strong and faith in the righteousness and victory of our call. Faith that through hard work, long struggle, and a whole lot of love and understanding, we can again step back on the stage of human history as a free, proud, and protective people, a free and productive people. So let me close as we always do. This is our duty, Black people, this Kwanzaa and all Kwanzaa, to know our past and honor it, to engage our present and improve it, and to imagine a whole new future and to forge it in the most ethical, effective, and expansive way. And this too, Black people, continue the struggle. Keep the faith, hold the line, love our people and each other, seek and speak truth, do and demand justice, be constantly concerned with the well-being of the world and all in it, and dare help rebuild the overarching movement that prefigures and makes possible the good world we all want and deserve to live in and leave as a legacy worthy of the name and history African. Hotel Ashe Hedi. Asante Sana, Dr. Karanga. We thank you so much for that message. It's so uplifting and encouraging. And we always appreciate the time that you take to come to Buffalo Kwanzaa and commune with us. Um, we were just wondering if you wanted to take questions. It looks like you're taking questions tonight. Yes, for a short time. I, 
I have a tight schedule I have to leave, but I'll take a few minutes anyhow, okay? Yes. Thank you so much. No problem. So we're taking questions from Facebook. So let us know what your questions are tonight for our founder, Dr. Malana Paringa, and just put it in the chat. I'm reading the chat and I will read the questions to him. Thank you for those hearts, Mother Sharon Holly. I see that. Thank you. So I don't have any yet. I'm just making okay. sure that I've made ourselves available. That's so. good, though. It's not it's, maybe maybe it's just sterile. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think I appreciate it. Was a, it was a sufficient message. <laughs> What'd you That's say? What, it was a sufficient message. You gave us so much to think about and to uh, meditate on yes. so that we can come back with, with all that we have to do, all the building that we have to do, united as a people. We have a lot. And we can do it. We can. We're, we're injured physicians. We, we have been wounded. But guess what? We have agency. And we have the capacity to actually heal and repair, remake, renew and remake ourselves in the process and practice of repairing and renewing and remaking the world. We need a radical reimagination of how the world would look and we have to give our lives to building it. That's, that's the message here. That's why we say continue to struggle, keep the faith and hold the line. Okay? There so I want to say thanks. Happy there Kwanzaa to everybody. Yes. There, there's one question. I apologize to interrupt. It says, um, how do we hold each other to the highest standard of human conduct? And that's from Baba and Karima Amin. Baba Ang and Karima Amin. So how do we hold each other to that standard that right. we know we need to have so that we can rebuild and repair? The first thing and the most important thing is live the life you want other people to live. Speak truth, do justice, care for each other, right? Make an extra effort to reach out, especially in this time of pandemic, right? This is time when we demonstrate what we're committed to, right? For people who can't get out, for people that need to have shopping done for them, for people that need for you to talk to them, make an effort. You have to be the model and mirror of what you want others to be. Right? That's the first thing. Second, always do things in a group. Try to build community, right? No matter what you do by yourself, it is not sufficient to transform the world in the way that we need. We must start with ourselves because Fanon said it, the, liber the liberation struggle uh, succeeds to the precise degree that every person take responsibility for liberating themselves in the context of community and constant struggle. In the context of community and struggle, we contribute to the overall good in the world, but it's always in community. And then be steadfast because that's gonna, that's why I said about faith, there's gonna be times when um, things don't look good, things look kind of bleak, you know, like you're doing the uh, all year round winter, right, right? But right. With all this whiteness, all this winter uh, uh, bleakness that is going on now, that's a speck of black, that's hope, right? And we, we have to grab that and we have to expand the realm of goodness, the realm of freedom, the realm of justice. And we have to give our lives, to that's important for us. So first of all, be the mirror and measure, right? And the model of what you want other people to do. That's holding them count. Because sometimes I don't even have to tell people things. I can walk in the room, people start talking different, start acting different, right? Right? Yeah. So you have to be like that, right? People know they can't talk while around me. You know what I mean? I don't want to hear no cousin. I don't want to hear no, you know, a pathology about black people. I, I don't want to even hear that, right? I don't talk it, I don't want to hear it, right? I want an agency. I want black people to be praised. I think black people are sacred. I told you there's no people more holy. There's nobody. Well, I'm not. I'm not going to scare you. So, but I'm just saying there's <laughs> there's nobody more holy than us, right? 
Right. I'm just telling you that. We got to we got to do that. We're the ones who introduced the concept as early as 2140 BCE that humans are in the image of the divine. They have a divine spark in them. And there's certain things we should not do to ourselves nor allow others. Other people think other people created that. No, that's black people. Second, we introduced something that's indispensable to any discussion of human rights. You can't even discuss human rights without discussing human dignity. And Africans gave that. The Sage Jetty introduced that concept called Shepesis in the Husea. Shepesu. Shepesu means inherent worthiness, that you have an inherent worthiness as a human being. You got it when you're born. Even before you're born, you, you're bringing it out in the world. You deserve to be respected, right? When you get here, there's three qualities to that inherent uh, worthiness. One is transcendent of all social and biological characteristics, race, class, gender, sexuality, age, ability, nationality, religion, etc. Second, it's equal in all. Nobody has more dignity than the others, right? We're not right. talking social dignity. We're talking about inherent worthiness, right? No one has more. It's all equal. And third, guess what? It's inalienable. Nobody can take it from you, and you can't even give it away. No matter what your social status is, you can be enslaved, you can be in prison wrongly, right? You can be, you, you can be conquered. You still don't leave, lose your dignity. In fact, that's what makes you fight to return to your rightful place as a free person. That's the important thing, right? So let's 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 give ourselves credit. I don't walk in the pale shadow of my oppressor and ask for directions, right? I'm not right. I'm not right. even into that. Okay, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> and they're asking about um how Africans in America should approach um politically and how we should approach environmental movements and climate change issues that we deal with. How should we need to get in, involved in those? You see, we can't let white people just talk green all the time. You know? White is white, green is green. You know? Black people got something to say about it. That's why I say we're, we're Wally Mwingo. We have to have a, a clear identity of who we are. And we have to link what is happening to us, even mm -hmm. in our health, with what's happening to the environment. The dominant society, they don't have a sense of the future. They're killing their own children, future children. They cause asthma. They put things in our neighborhood that make our children grow up with asthma, right? They don't have, to, they have breathing issues already. Right. Our vulnerability to COVID-19 and to other illnesses come from our poor environment, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the quality of air. Look at what they're doing, uh, pumping filthy water to the people in Flint. But that's going on in other places. We just haven't identified it yet, right? You know that. So we have to be powerful. We have to organize. And Black people have got to get back into these organizations and rebuild an overarching movement. It's good to say Black Lives Matter. But the question is, do Black people matter to themselves enough to organize their own movement? It's yep. not enough to say, oh, look at all many white people. This is petty bourgeoisie. Oh, look at all the white people out there. Hey, look, that's not you. They get, I told people before, they're going to go home. They've gone home, by the way. So the, the reality is we still have the problem. So the question is, can we build like we did 60, but even take it further, right? Mm -hmm. We've got to have Black organizations, right? We've got to have Black people mobilized. First of all, we, it's four, four basic stages we need for transformation. Mm -hmm. Education, mobilization, organization, and confrontation. Mm -hmm. People have to know. And one of the things that we've got to overcome is people illusion of knowledge. I used to teach this all the time. There's a difference between unawareness or lack of knowledge and the illusions of knowledge. Mm -hmm. In the lack of knowledge, you just all you have to do to overcome that is give some knowledge. Mm -hmm. But the illusion of knowledge prevents you from getting knowledge. It does. See? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ignorance is just the absence of knowledge, but illusions is the assumption of knowledge, even when you don't have it. So it's a lot of times people believe they know more than they do, just like about Kwanzaa. They, they, they might not get the book, right? I mean, I'm talking about my book. I'm not talking about things you see on the 
internet where the white man is always talking about, oh, Kwanzaa deteriorating, Kwanzaa hasn't been celebrated. They have to say that, right? They don't write that about Hanukkah. They don't even write that about Christmas, right? They, they just got to say that because they're not the subject of it. They didn't create it. So they got to find something wrong with it, it or me or something. <laughs> They're going to say some pathology, no matter what else they say, right? So what we have to do is learn. What does Kwanzaa mean? What does it mean beyond lighting the candles? What does the candle mean? What does the light mean? What is the ceremony? This is an intellectual project. It's not something invented is dropped from the sky. Right, it came from the struggle. It came from wanting to learn Africa to return to our own history and culture because we had been lifted out of that. Right, that's the first part. So going back to the first fruit celebrations and to African community and value, but it was built in the fires and furnace and fighting of the '60s. Right, the Black yes. Freedom Movement. So what yes. does that mean? It means it's an act of freedom, it's an instrument of freedom, and it's a celebration of freedom. It's an act of freedom in that we broke the psychological chains, the catechism of possibility taught by the, 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 the dominant society. We refused to seek permission. We wanted to do this. We wanted to speak our own special culture truth. We don't ask permission. We don't want penalty and oppression because of that. We declared our holiday, practiced it. Then they came and started talking about it. Right? That's an act of freedom, breaking the catechism of impossibility, breaking this, the, 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 the conversation that made us problematize ourselves from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. That's an act of freedom. Second, it's an instrument of freedom. It was built to bring Black people together so that they could reaffirm their humanity and human right, defend them, and resist all violations to them. It's knowing who we are. It's being ourselves that enables us to free ourselves. If we pretend we don't know ourselves, we just blackish or some other kind of thing, or if we choose a, a secondary identity or a tertiary identity instead of black, right? That's a problem. Black is our primary identity. We're black regardless of what are the other things we add to it. And if all we are is that secondary tertiary identity, we can find that among white people, right? So we have to start with black. We have to start at the beginning. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an instrument of freedom. It challenges people to struggle, to be themselves and to free themselves. And then finally, it's a celebration of us achieving culture and political freedom mm -hmm. in the midst of righteous and relentless struggle. That's something to celebrate. I mean, that's something really to celebrate, real. Yeah. real. So that's... that's uh, I know there are a couple more on the line. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You got, you got everybody fired up here. So I got like four questions in the queue, but Tonya has one. Please. My, my question would be that I feel like you have some kind of prophetic sense and I want to know, did you see something like this pandemic coming and how do you see us coming out of it as an intact people for our own communities? Like, did you see it coming and then how do you see us coming out of it? Did you hear what she said? I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Could you repeat her? Because y'all's mic, y'all seem for both you and her and uh you. Frank, Frank, and you seems far away. Yes, yes, sir. So I know you have to be, but could you say again what she said? Yes. I'm so sorry she, I didn't hear you. That's a, she said that she feels you have a prophetic sense. So her question is, did you see this COVID-19 pandemic or something like it coming? And the second part of the question is. How do we come out of it? How do we rebound from it? And that was one of the questions from Facebook also, is how do we rebound from the COVID, COVID pandemic as a people to go back to rebuilding and getting ourselves on strong footing? Mm -hmm. yeah. right. So that's the two parts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first thing is, did I see it coming? Of course, I'm not a prophet, but you know, you can study patterns, right? So yeah. guess what? African culture, uh, uh, proverbial wisdom say, if you know the beginning well, the end won't trouble you. So if we invade animal habitats, right? Right. If we slaughter and kill and drop blood everywhere, right? We can't be surprised when uh, uh, viruses come from that, which is, it doesn't even make sense to, to do that. If, if we change the world, we can't be surprised when it changes also, you know. If we strike the world, we can't be surprised 
when nature strikes back at us, right? We can't, we can't do that. Same with climate change. You know, if you keep doing the gas out gases, the, the, pardon me, uh, the greenhouse gases, if you keep doing that, if you keep burning fossil fuels, if you keep digging and plundering and raping the earth, you've got to have a barren planet. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see it. I mean, that's, that's the pattern. If you know the beginning well, the end won't trouble you. Mm -hmm. And they are doing dignity denying, life destroying, and world, world devastating practices. That's what not only the corporations and the imperialist countries are doing, but we, if we participate in consumerism, mindless, Mm. and unrestrained consumerism, just eating up the world, eating up the world and throwing away the remains. Mm -hmm. We're trashing the ocean. We can't, look at this. And, 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 and by 20, I think, I think the uh, Secretary General said by 2030, if we don't back up, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine, and we're breathing Oh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, particles, particles, plastic particles right now. Yeah. I don't know how long that's going to last. You know what I'm saying? You see some of these science fiction horror movies, you know, where we'd be turning into something else. So I think it's very important for us to take this seriously, get involved in the green movement. And the green movement is good. And we have to push Biden and Kamala Harris. Uh, you know, I like Kamala. So I'm saying, you know, not just because she <laughs> told me in my, house in the and as we passed in the airport and she practiced Kwanzaa and she also did a tape recently on that not just because of them, because she's a black woman but guess what we got to cherish and challenge her you know you can cherish somebody I told people about that about Obama Obama left us high and dry because people cherished him but didn't challenge him right, right. so we can't do the same thing with um with 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 Kamala we have to cherish her but challenge her at the same time and she can do a lot of good. She has the initiative. Uh, I mean, you know, she's a stronger person. Than, I don't want to do this, uh, but she's strong. She's strong. Let me say, she's strong in her own right. And she's going to play a major role in the administration. Mm -hmm. So she has to be right. And she can't go in there with mindless patriotism and talking war and, 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 and undermining the Palestinians, and refer, re, uh, not undermine, but doing policies that continue to destroy. Uh, Palestine or destroy and, and, and support the occupation of Haiti, Palestine, the war in Yemen. I mean, do you know what they're doing to the people in Yemen? And what is the, what is our voice on the Rohingya uh, 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 in, in Burma or the Uyghurs in China? We can't just say something about that. How can we who suffered so much be silent on this when other people are suffering? And we've got to get involved in the immigration movement, right? It's not just Latinos out there, and even though Latinos, some of them are black, but they're black. There's Africans from Haiti. No one is treated worse than Haitians, right? And then the continental Africans, right? And Africans from the Caribbean and other places, right? We've got to get involved. We got to get active, and we can't get into these Q conspiracy theories, right? Let me just tell you about conspiracies, right? It's plain to me what the dominant society is doing what the white oppressor is doing. So if you got white friends, okay, I'm gonna say the white oppressor, right? The <laughs> white oppressor is actually whew, destroying the world, right? Mm -hmm. And it's so greedy in this corporate trust and in this imperial trust that they don't care about what happens to anybody. And if we don't play our role, recoup our role as a moral and social vanguard of this country and yeah. stop going along with conspiracies, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do well. Now, let me, when I, I started talking about conspiracy and I, and I tripped and went to this other point. So I want to go back. <laughs> I want to go back to conspiracy. Now, you, you, do you know that this system was set in place in the 1700s? It is a structure. Racism is systemic. Capitalism is systemic. The, play, the thing is set up. The Holocaust of enslavement was systemic. Segregation was systemic. Lynching was systemic. The police shooting us is systemic. That's using the law to kill us. 
that's uh, racism turning public turning <clears throat> hatred and hostility into public policy and socially sanctioned practice that's what happens when the european or the dominant society or the racist whoever you want to call them they turn their hatred and hostility into public policy and mm -hmm. and socially sanctioned practice and we have to resist that but we can't resist that talking conspiracy the system was set up to work this way it has worked this way since the 1700s except when there's intervention to change it and we have done that but we have not finished right our black freedom movement was a great contribution to advancing human freedom in this country and the world that's why all around the world and in this country people borrow our moral vocabulary and our moral vision and pose our struggle as a model to emulate native americans latinos asian women right white women uh, uh gays and lesbians right older people right disabled people they all they are, look at around the around the world africa asia and at the Chinese Democratic Wall, the European uh, 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 countries struggling for dem democracy for a war, the Palestinian struggle, the Arab Spring. Look how they sang our songs, borrowed our moral vocabulary and our moral vision, posed our struggle as a model. We got to take ourselves as serious as the world sees us at our best. And I think we can do it. I believe in our people. I'm into the seven principles. Imani. I mean, and I like how the Christians say, I'm stepping out on faith. Well, we got to step out and stay out on faith. You know, that's what we got to do. We can't just step out and get back. We got to step out and go on. So watch those conspiracies. One last thing about conspiracy. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know that we have to have a healthy suspicion against the dominant society that has had all kinds of experiments on us since the Holocaust of enslavement. Mm -hmm. And we should be righteously uh, hesitant and reluctant to just jump into things that haven't been tested, proved, and reaffirmed by people we respect, Black doctors, right? right. Black clinicians and researchers, right? They should mm -hmm. tell us this vaccine is good. But after they do, we can't keep saying, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to take it. We got to do it because we're dying more than anybody else, besides maybe the Native American, right? So black people have got to take the lead here and go on, be healthy and struggle for a new world. Let me say this last thing about Georgia. Send some money to Georgia, send some people to Georgia, find out who's doing that. This is a critical, this is a critical campaign that people are fighting down there in Georgia. This can determine the direction of this country for decades. And so I think it's very important for us to take it serious. You got people down there, ask the people to get out and vote. Ask them to get out and work uh, and, and, and get the people out to vote. Not only vote themselves, but get other people uh, to vote. This is a crucial election here in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there are a lot more questions. I don't know how much time we have, so I just want to okay. ask before I keep going, let me know. OK, I'm, I, I have to go in 10 minutes. Tim, are you I, okay. I should go now, but I'm going to go in 10 minutes. I'm enjoying <laughs> this myself. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I have to explain to... that Buffalo held me. <laughs> <laughs> I try to merge some of them together. So, you okay, know, would you please? That'd be good. Okay, so I have these two questions together, and it's about um, so you already told us how we can rebound from COVID as a community, but how do we specifically target our young people and getting them to accept? the principles of Kwanzaa and how they apply to our daily lives. And that also tells us how to move forward with these seven principles. Because we always talk about Kwanzaa 365, but how do we actually implement that? For some of us, we know, but we'd like you to explain for the entire community how that is possible to live Kwanzaa every day and, and, and bring our youth into it and our mm -hmm. children into it. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, <clears throat> it's the attitude you take toward you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Got to cherish and challenge them. I've said mm -hmm. this, I said it in the Million Man March, they have absence mission statement. I'm saying it now. I've said it since the sixties. I did most of my work by the time I was 24, I had laid out my life and I have not diverted from that, right? 
So mm -hmm. young people also have to take initiative, right? We can't keep asking for them. They've got to ask for themselves. Fanon mm -hmm. said, each generation must discover its mission and having discovered it, either fulfill or betray it. Mm. So what is our mission but to bring good into the world, right? To ask what is necessary and to work from the position we're in as doctor, lawyer, journalist, judge, right? Teacher, right? Pharmacist, farmer. We take that position and bring good into the world, right? So it's mm -hmm. not like they can be concerned. They have to take a position. So you've got to cherish them and challenge them, challenge them to choose a mission, to accept a mission, to get involved with the movement that's out there now, right? And if they think it's something else should be done, then do it. There are a lot of movements out there. There's clearly the most advertised now and the wide, most widespread is the Black Lives Matter movement. But there's a reparation movement you can get in. There's a Kawita movement you can get in. There's a poor people current thing you can get in. There's an anti-prison movement you can get in, abolition movement, right? There's so many, there's a, there's the environmental uh, movement. You can get in so many movements. You've got to challenge them. You've got to keep, stop babying them. Stop giving them money, right? As, as a substitute for love, you know, and, and for direction. As a, as a parent, you got to parent. You can't be their friend. That's another thing. Stop trying to be your friend, right? Don't dress like them. Right? They're not, this is another time, comrades, you know, you know, you got, you, you got to stop uh, wearing their clothes and just got winking at their women and men. You you got to get on out there and, and, and talk to them like parents. You can always question the rightness of your decision, but you should never question your right to make a decision and to suggest it. And, and even for real young people to in fact uh, implement it and say, look, you have to do this. You have to do this, especially at a time when they need strong direction to finish and make something out of their life because they have so many forces against them and they don't have the strong uh, co community that we had when we were segregated. You know, like we knew who, who was the enemy then. It wasn't even no question. We didn't have to talk. I wonder who it is. You know, we saw the, the monster at the gate, right? Now everybody, oh, I don't know. Well, some of them, are, please. The reality <laughs> is you don't have wealth. You don't have power. You don't have the same status. Unless white people who say they're your friends and your allies share wealth, share power, and accept an equal status, they are not serious. That's right. Right? right. right. Giving Black Lives Matter a million dollars or a billion dollars does not solve the problem of Black people. That's right. just the good. That's conscious money. And look at all that stuff they did after the killing, the public murder of George Floyd. Oh, I'm guilty. I see I was wrong. Where's all that now? And how did that translate into uh, to a guaranteed income for Black people or health care for Black people or clean water and food security for Black people? How did it do that, right? It has not done that. They have not changed, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so we've got to struggle. And the only time they change is when we, united, compel the change. That's what we've got to do. It's on us. I'm sorry. And even the allies we used to have, they've gotten rich and gone. We used to have some white allies, right? We used to have a lot of them, right? When they were kicked out, right? But now, of course, they got other interests, right? They got money themselves and they got a problem they, get, they can't solve because it's not morally right, right? And they've got to take a stand for good in the world. They can't just be, you know, talking abstract and claiming a history that no longer exists. We've got to face the fact that what we do today not only honors our past, but actually determines our future. And Malcolm said, Minister Malcolm X said, the future belongs for those who prepare for it. And there's no better way to prepare for it than through education and struggle. There is no substitute for an aware, organized and engaged people constantly involved in a multiplicity of activities to define, defend, and advance their interests. Mm, 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 mm. That's, that's such an excellent message. There, there's so many things going through my mind <laughs> when you're talking about these things. I do teach 
So, and I homeschool and I have quite a number of children. I have seven. So all of those things, you know, just are a lot of things that I speak to even my students and my parents that I work with about those issues. So would you say, because another question was, um, what is, like, if we had to pick one main thing that we need to focus on, what would that be? So even for the kids and for us at, in our age group and even for our elders, um, what I'm hearing from you, I'm thinking would be education because education seems to be the first thing and then we can move from education to organizing or, or, or is there something that you think that we should focus on besides the education first? Because I know we're working with like the children being in public schools and all the things that's happening there what should be the, the, one, the one main thing or one first thing that we focus on to, to move us forward? I said it in the sixes, I repeat it now. The battle yeah. we're fighting, the first and foremost battle we're fighting is the battle to win the hearts and minds of our people. If we lose that battle, we can't hope to win any. So education is first. In the beginning was and is the word, right? We've got yeah. to speak. We've got to imagine. We can't even imagine if we don't have the categories for it. That's why I said until we break the monopoly that the oppressor has on so many of our minds, liberation is not only impossible, it's unthinkable. You can't, what you can't conceive, you can't achieve. So right. education is fundamental, coming into consciousness. But you don't do step by step. You do it all at once and you emphasize one. So we need education, we need mobilization, we need organization, and we need confrontation. But we need it all at once. But the first stress is always on education. We've got to know what is to be done. That's the question. What is to be done? That requires education. How do we understand ourselves in the world? That requires education, right? Yeah. Culturally grounded education. Yes. Our professor cannot be our teacher. Our culture must be our teacher. Our best practices in our culture must be our best teachers. Ella mm -hmm. Baker is our best, one of our best teachers. Malcolm X, Fannie Lou Hamer, Messenger Muhammad, right? Frederick Douglass, Nat Turner, right? Sojourner True, Harry Tubman. All of these people do their written, oral, or living practice text. Three kinds of texts we can read. Right. I said written, oral, and living practice texts. If we yeah. read those texts, that is an infinite library of lessons for us of how we understand and assert ourselves in the world. That's what we've got to do. And we've got yeah. to build as we learn. We've got to do as we learn. We've yeah. got to struggle as we learn, right? Yeah. So we can't hide. Uh, look, when I was in, when I was in college, I, I was in about three different organizations, right? I kept struggling. And then when I when I when I saw that I needed one organization, I left and built our organization, us, right? That's what I did. That's what Wrote did. my philosophy, sit down and thought, meditated, isolated myself, and then also engaged myself because you can't work in isolation. There's a place you got to start there and do that work and acquire time, but you got to go out and test that in practice. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I shay, I shay, Dr. Corrine. Thank you so much for coming and joining us tonight. Uh, I hope you, you enjoyed it as much as we have. I did, and I did. <laughs> I, enjoyed it. I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed Buffalo, you know? And I'm yeah. glad we can do it virtually because we're getting to the point where it was just overwhelming. And, you know, I get to take care of my house, Tim you my companion, and all things good and beautiful. And I didn't want it to become too fragile with all this going out here. So we had to just lock down, lock down, say, hey, I'm sending you a note virtually. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll take it. We'll take it. So we embrace. We embrace virtually. Okay. Yes. Do that for yes. all of us, right? Yes. Do that for all of us, all of our people everywhere. Okay. Yes, sir. It's so important. Yes, thank you. For friends uh -huh. and family to embrace. Asante. Take care. To town nine. Head is at Kwanzaa. Head is at Have a good New Year too. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we're still live, Emmanuel. We're still live. <laughs>